So first of all, I want to welcome you to day one, week one of comparative politics. And this is uh, going to be your first lecture uh, that I'll be, normally I don't do lectures. I actually, when we're in my classroom, we'd be discussing this uh, and talking about the issues. I would just simply set it up and basically launch the discussion. And then we would be discussing as a class all the various issues. But in this situation, we're not doing that. Um, I have to be able to sort of deal with this in an online environment. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and so uh, with that, I want to give you, you know, over the next uh, several weeks, um, you're going to get different variations of how I do my lectures. Sometimes you'll see it like this, where I will always start off with an introduction, like you'll see me. Then I may digress into the PowerPoints, and I may have the PowerPoint ups, PowerPoints up by themselves. Uh, other times you'll see me in the back in the little right-hand corner. Like today, you'll see me down in the little corner. Other times you may also see me uh, where it's just me talking to you without utilizing uh, PowerPoints. Uh, but I'm going to try different things, and I might vary from week to week. Uh, but just to get your feet wet, uh, we're going to jump into this and uh, have our first lecture. So without further ado, uh, I want to welcome you to Chapter 1. And Chapter 1 really looks at a pretty interesting question. And that question is, first of all, what is comparative politics? And then secondly, why do we study it? What's the importance of looking at, why do we compare things? What's the importance of comparing things, uh, whether it be regarding our class, which is politics or even other things? Uh, and if you ask yourself that question, there are some very, very interesting answers that come to that. And so uh, one of the things you might find, for example, if you were comparing, like when you go to buy clothes, right? Uh, what do you compare? What do you look at, right? It, what is the quality? Is it the cut? Is it the, how they look on your body? Or if you go to buy groceries or go to buy food, how do you compare whether you buy one item or the next item? You know, is it because of the quality of the food or the, the brand? There are lots of things that we compare and lots of reasons we compare them. And uh, comparisons certainly are a, a most important thing that we have to help us make better decisions, about, no matter what it is. And so I think you'll see as we go into this and I jump into the PowerPoints uh, in this particular uh, start that you'll see why, the, why there's value there and why it's important that we do this. So with, let me jump in now and you're going to see me pop down into your little corner, uh, but I'll still be on the screen for this particular uh, lecture. OK, here we go. So, um, like I said, what is comparative politics and, you know, why do we study it is really the, the key of this chapter. And it's interesting because on one hand, you can make the argument that, you know, well, there are lots of reasons why we should, we can study uh, comparative politics. And there are lots of things that we look at. So, you know, po political science as a field is very wide and, and varied. And there are many different aspects and subfields of political science and of comparative politics that are in the structure. And so it really has a lot to do with how we look at the world and how the world is organized and basically, in a very simple way, it really asks, looking at how America does what it does, and then we can compare our system to other systems around the world to hopefully make our system better. Now, I will tell you that that doesn't always work that way. <laughs> Sometimes you can't, like, for example, if we're looking at democratic systems around the world, and they all do things a little bit differently. And then the, the issue with that is simply this. So... If you were to take the U.S. version of democracy and try and take it and apply it in some other part of the world that also has a democracy, would it work the same way? Uh, would it be just as, if you want to call our successful, the question is, would it be as successful? And the answer, you might say, well, of course, you take our system and you take it somewhere else and it, put it in, into you know, operation, of course it is. And that's not necessarily true because there are a lot of other things that play at what makes ours different and successful in our, in, potentially in our country, that may not apply like in England or in other parts of the world that have democratic systems, like Japan, for example. And you might say, well, why is that the case? Well, there are lots of reasons why that's the case. So, for example, one of the reasons that's the case is because of the historical uh, context of those countries. So their democracy is built around a different set of historical uh, realities that have led them to develop their democracy. Uh, their structure of government may be different. There may be re religious aspects that drive their democracy or, the, or lack thereof. Uh, there certainly could be cultural aspects. 
you know, with all the different aspects. Some, some countries are much more homogenous than we are, uh, meaning that they may, like, for example, Japan is mostly Japanese folks. And if you look at America, we are a really diverse population of people, which brings along a whole other set of issues and things that people have to deal with that other countries may not have to deal with. There certainly are resource issues. There are economic issues that are also at play in these systems in terms of the success or failure of their of their of their systems. So when you compare them, you can't just say that, well, one size fits all. And so I think that's really the beauty of it. But it also begs us to recognize that political science in and of itself is in the comparative politics recognizes that politics is constantly changing. And because it constantly changes means we have to be able to sort of step back and change with it. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm assuming you answered yes. So let's continue on. So this is showing you some pictures of various, some of the famous uh, residences of, uh, of the seats of government of, of the world. Obviously on the left is the White House. Um, if you look at the middle, uh, that is the Japanese palace. And then to the right uh, is the uh, royal palace in Spain. Uh, this is just a couple of examples of the fancy houses of government that uh, reside for the leaders. Uh, here on the left is in England, 10 Downing Street, which is their, their seat of government. And then on the right is uh, the seat of government for Iceland. Uh, pretty, pretty chill, pretty out in the middle of nowhere, cold as heck up there, but still, nonetheless, that's their place. Um, again, as I mentioned before, there are many subfields within political science. Uh, and even within those subfields, uh, like American politics, international relations, political philosophy, so forth. There are various numerous aspects within them that even within the subfields that we can compare aspects of the subfields in terms of their correlation or connection to one another. And they're all tied together. So we can compare different things even within the subfields of political science. Uh, I would argue that the United Nations in and of itself is brings together the nexus of those comparative issues that we have and be able to look at the, you know, how democracies treat one another, act toward one another, or how non-democracies treat or act one another. So the, it's, the, the two actually work sort of hand in hand with one another. So, you know, but this, bring, this international body brings us together to sort of develop an understanding of the things that work, that work well across the board and the things that don't. So in looking at like the United Nations, you might say when the United States and England are looking at their common practices, or the things that make their system successful, we may be able to look across the board if you're trying to develop, the, you know, looking at the United States and how we develop our democratic systems or how they evolve, you might say, well, there are common themes about how successful we are that are common to what, what leads to success in other political systems that are also democracies. Just like those that are non-democratic, uh, you might say, well, we've also seen the trends and what leads them to be non-democratic and be able to also assess those things. So it's really important that we're able to look through these various lenses to sort of look and understand how the world works and the things that potentially can lead us to success uh, to have better democratic systems that involve the people, right? Okay. Uh, this is just some of the great philosophers of history that you see here. They've got all these great, uh, these great philosophers uh, across different areas. And I'm not going to go through all of them. There's Thomas Hobbes on the left there and got John Locke hanging out and Rousseau. So you've got all these famous uh, political philosophers. And even these guys, the thing that's beautiful about what they did and what they do is to ask a very quick, simple question. And I remember when I was an undergrad going, oh, what do I want a political philosophy? What's so important about these old guys from two, three, five, six hundred years ago? What do, I, what do I care about what they what they had to say? Here's why it's important. <laughs> because what they're really looking at is human nature. And while they're looking at a snapshot in time, right, they don't have the, the ability to look two, three, four, five hundred years in the future to see where human beings, how they act. They do have the luxury, though, of being able to look at the snapshot of time they're living in and the environment they live in, and then compare it to the past. So then the, the issue is how do we, when we're comparing the, the ideas of what these individuals say, it, it asks this one simple question. Are there commonalities in our human nature that, have, that, we, that resonate uh, through from time from 2000 years ago with Aristotle all the way up to today that we can assess about human beings and their action or reaction to certain events that happen in history. 
And being able to do that allows us to be able to sort of future cast and look at what the future might look like because there are certain things that are possible or endemic, I should say, to human nature that will drive how we see the world in the future, okay? And so that's why I've learned to appreciate these guys. Uh, not the haircut so much, but I appreciate these guys. Uh, not the clothing either, by the way. Uh, they definitely need some shorts and flip-flop stuff going on, but that didn't work out for these guys 500 years ago. Uh, but nonetheless, this is, this is how, the essence of what we look at when we compare certain things. Now, I'm going to jump ahead here because um, some of the things that we look at when we, when we talk about additional subfields within political science, look at political economics, look at polit public policy and political psychology. They're also subfields. And again, we can basically do comparative analysis across various types of economic systems. So if you look at that first one, you see up here, they talk about capitalism, socialism, communism, fascism. And we're talking about the economic aspects, right? The economic theories behind these, these uh, systems. And so we can look and say, okay, so based on looking at the political economics theories, what, you know, that either lead to success or failure of the economic systems of these various countries, what can we learn from that, right? What can we learn from these that tell us the story and what, what, what do we have in common and what do we have that's different in those systems? Same thing applies in public policy. Uh, you could also explore the same various aspects of political institutions that exist within states and how they operate uh, effectively and what leads to and, and compare those across various systems. So that's basically the essence of understanding the importance of the various subfields when we look at them. So again, here's an example of the subfields within political science. You can see at the top political philosophy, then around the circle, you see all the various other groups that are there, including American politics, international relations, comparative, you have research methods, models, and so forth. Uh, and these are all the primary subfields that currently exist today. So when we talk about looking from the historical uh, factors, one of the things that we look at is like, how did this all come to be? You know, where did, where did the idea of comparative politics originate? And it originates with, uh, a really cool dude named Aristotle. Now, Aristotle is considered the founding father of political science in the context of he's the first person to take the idea, the ideas of Plato, who was, who was his teacher. And Plato wrote a, wrote a very famous book called The Republic. And then Aristotle, who was his student, basically took Plato's his foundational thoughts about the idea of politics and then he's the first person to sort of classify different types of systems of governance and place them in the positive and negative categories. As a matter of fact, Aristotle looked at democracy as being one of the negative forms of government uh, because he said that the negative forms serve the, the rulers or the ruler and the positive forms serve the people. And he said dem that democracy basically was self-serving and served to separate and divide people. Uh, so he did not like democracy. Ironically, it is the core of most of the, of the modern world is based on democratic principles. At least that's what we like to think. Uh, so anyhow, this is sort of the historical basis of this. And, and he's the first person to, vary, to compare various types of systems and sort of look at you know, the associative problems that exist between each of, within each of those systems. OK. Um, and then here's some of the, the noted, uh, these noted, these guys are the, are the comparative theorists to basically lay out the, the notions of how we go about comparing and the, and the reasons that we compare various political systems. Uh, and so, um, as you can see, one of them said, O'Neill said, comparative politics is a study in comparison of politics across countries. Uh, O'Neill also in 2004 said that politics is the struggle of any group, in any group for power that will give a person or people the ability to make decisions for the larger group. Um, and that comparative politics is a subfield that compares the struggles across various countries, right? So being able to look at that and look at the various issues and, and positive and negative issues that exist within certain countries allows you to be able to compare and understand where the struggles begin and where the successes uh, begin within each country. Okay. So again, so you can look at the various uh, institutional constructs. So when you look at comparative uh, politics and comparative studies, again, we're looking inside 
you know, each each particular country and assessing various structural aspects of it. So looking at their political systems, looking at their the norms within within their societies and the values that they have and how they actually work or either lead to success or failure of their democratic systems or even their non-democratic systems. So if you were looking at the uh, United States, you know, when you look at what makes our system successful, well, you might say there are certain things that do make it work that are pretty cool. And then you look at things that make it struggle. Well, what are things that make it struggle? Well, you know, we're even though we're a very diverse society, which is pretty cool, that there's a lot of unfortunate, you know, people who have bias, whether it be by ethnicity or racism, or whether it be by sex or sexual orientation or economics, you know, there are people who discriminate for all different types of reasons. And those kinds of things lead to the degradation of your society. Uh, however, you know, recognizing how much that impacts the success or failure of our democracy is what we be, what we be looking at in this particular aspect. So looking at the institutional framework and then recognizing that under formal institutions uh, that are big, those are again that are based on a clear set of rules that have been formalized through laws and policies uh, is the essence of our, the institutional framework of most political systems. Well, even non-democratic systems have a very formal structuralized uh, set of laws and rules. And then we also have what we call informal institutions. And those informal institutions are basically those that are kind of flying by the seat of their plant, uh, pants. They're, they're not written in stone, uh, but they may have historical precedents. So sometimes you have things that have been done a certain way over a long period of time. And that then they, so they become sort of formalized, even if they're not completely, even if they're not written in law. Um, so they may not be formalized, but they're usually formalized in some way because they have historical precedent. And pre historical precedent means it's kind of, like I said, they've been doing it this way all along for decades and decades. So it sort of becomes sort of institutionalized. Um, and then you have your thing, political institutions, which again are the structures within a political system and how the political decision-making takes place, um, how the structure of politics is set up in those countries and so forth. Okay. And then when we talk about and with you know regarding regions of the world or certain area studies, you know when we can we, we can compare across various regions, you know the question is what are, what would be the things we would be looking at to compare if we were looking at, for example, to Asia, to Latin America, to Africa, to the Middle East, to Europe, what what kinds of things would would be important to compare if we were looking at the like continents or regions. And I would argue that sometimes we have to break them down into smaller systems, and other times we need them at relatively larger systems that we, we actually look at. It depends on what it is we're trying to find. And sometimes you start with the bigger picture and work to the smaller picture. Other times you start with the smaller picture and then build out a framework. Because for example, if you're looking at the Middle East, which is my direct area of expertise, the question would be, you know, so, you know, if you're comparing systems, can you look at all the different countries of the Middle East and say that they all operate a certain way institutionally, for example, or even formally or informally? And the answer is no. And then the question is, are there some commonalities? Yeah, there's some commonalities, but even within those commonalities, they're complicated. So if you're saying, well, the commonality is religion, they have Islam. Well, that's true, but there are various aspects of Islam and they're very different from from country to country within the Middle East, even from region to region, even within a country, there are sub little subgroups within the countries that are very different and have different interpretation. Kind of like in Christianity, right? Where you have different aspects. We have various Christian groups that start from, from the Catholics on one side, all the way to Seventh-day Adventists and Baptists and Methodists, Presbyterian, blah, 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 blah. There's all kinds of different variations. So just in understanding that basic, under, that one notion, just using religion, you can see how within the framework of one, region it's you couldn't just even within comparing within those regions you can't just get a one size fits all does it tell a story absolutely is it important to understand that absolutely so you know these are the things we have to assess and when we develop our foreign policy which is under the umbrella of international relations about toward other countries when we develop policies toward them it is fundamentally important that we know these things and know the differences and and the commonalities of countries within a particular region of the world. And so that's why this the study of comparative politics is so important. And again, we talk about this because, you know, when you look at it in a global you know, context, 
you're really talking about what we call cross-national studies uh, because it doesn't have any national borders. We're looking across various systems. Uh, and even if you go back and look at the Cold War and various events historically in history, you could ar argue that it's important to be able to look at, you know, things that are based on, that are systemic, that uh, whether you're looking at East-West rivalry or looking at, uh, you know, communism versus democracy, right, which doesn't have any borders and those kinds of things. That's what, those are what, what we call cross-national studies, uh, you know, political revolutions um, that happen throughout history. I taught a revolutions course at UCSD uh, several years ago, and it was interesting to go through the study and look at how revolutions actually occur. And I actually did it as it wasn't a comparative politics class, but I did it in sort of that vein because I really wanted the students to understand what are the common things that that it, within revolutions that lead up to rev resolution, revolutions, excuse me, and then what things cause them, you know, what do they, what do they gain the, the momentum for success? And then where does the failure happen? Are there commonalities in why they fail? Uh, and those types of things, whether it's the French Revolution or whether it's the Bolshevik Revolution or the Iran Revolution in 1979, the idea is what leads to the Cuban Revolution. The idea is what leads to these revolutions? Are they, you know, did they ever, are they ever successful? You know, what about the American Revolution? You know, and then the question is, so where does the success come from? Or how do we even define success? But we look for the little blips on the screen that we can compare that helped us dictate as to where the success or failures come from. And then subnational studies, again, this is basically when we look within certain, within, within governments. So you're looking inside the bubble of your own country. So uh, we start off with the notion of sovereignty. And, you know, when we look at governments, you know, so, you know, what kind of leadership do they have? Is it a democratic system where you have a president? Is there a, or is there a prime minister? Is government shared? Is it a monarchy? Or is it a tyrannical authoritarian system? Like in North Korea, where you have, you know, you have one leader who basically runs everything. You know, how, how are they set up? And then when you talk about under the auspices of governments, there's usually three basic types of government that exist. One is called federal government, basically where it's power shared in like the United States, power shared between like the, the Fed, the national or federal government and the very, in the states. So the subnational government would be considered states in the United States. So each, so we share power between like California shares power with Washington, D.C. in terms of the, the federal government. And we share power back and forth. Uh, then unitary governments, which basically the power is concentrated at the federal government level. So basically the federal government tells all the states what they want them to do in the United States, as an example. And then confederal is basically the power is within the states. So the states basically dictate to the federal government what they want them to do. And those are the three different aspects of government systems that we kind of start off with. Now, do they have nuances to these systems? Absolutely. But this gives us a, a starting point to understand all the various types of governmental systems that exist within the world. So when we talk about, you know, where they, you know, what happens when they start to devolve, you know, when when crises happens, how do they, what, how do they transfer power and with the, from from one system to the, from one government to the next government? Does it have it happen peacefully? Does it happen in a, in a vacuum? Is it violent? Uh, unfortunately, in our last election, it got, you know, after the last election with January 6th, it really was a disaster uh, because it was first time in our history we did not have a peaceful transfer of power in the United States. Um, so this is basically the reasons that we, how we go about comparing. And um, there are other aspects of this you'll be looking at throughout the chapter, but that is really the foundational component that I wanted to share with you. I took about 24 minutes to do that, which wasn't too bad for a first start. Uh, and I look forward to in, engaging you more on this, but uh, now the rest is up to you. So make sure you, you go through and read the, read the chapters. Make sure you check out the PowerPoints for, for this and, uh, and then jump into any videos that may be, be there. And then make sure you get into the, the chapter overview, which basically is your ability to tell me what you took from the chapter that you thought was important. Um, so make sure you do that and you know, give me some good effort on that. And then also last but not least is, is the discussion. And look at the discussion question that I posed, respond to it. Remember, I'm looking for a really good, a really good, uh, nice size paragraph of your response to me. And then when you go to look at your, your classmates' responses, I'll be looking for that as well, okay? Not a lot of work, but it's, it's gonna give you a chance to sort of think about this and move from there, okay? All right, you guys, have a great one.
actually almost 25 minutes. All right, thanks.